As TNA Knockouts World Champion Jordan Grace confidently stepped into an NXT ring, she did so carrying the palpable promise of pan-promotional prohibited portal possibilities. However, this isn't the first time that WWE and TNA have orbited each other's respective wrestling universes. Grab yourself some Mahi Mahi and meet me at the Alamo as we look at the send-offs, the trade-offs, the unexpected turn-ups, and the very expected put-downs of every WWE and TNA crossover ever possibly so far. Ever since their arrival, TNA have had that rebel spirit, knowing they were entering a post-attitude wrestling era where WWE was the only game in town. If there was a chance to poke the bear, the TNA boys would do it. So when the E-Team rocked up at Universal Studios, the home of TNA Impact, to film the commercial for the 2005 Royal Rumble, you know, the one where they reenacted West Side Story, don't pretend you didn't love it, a bear-poking opportunity was created. TNA turned up with a camera and shot footage around the sound stage that WWE was using, for which WWE allegedly threatened to sue TNA if they broadcast it. Throwing caution to the wind and throwing legal warnings in the bin, we were going to see what went down on that fateful day on TNA Turning Point, their pay-per-view. A unique hook for a pay-per-view that, admittedly. Come and see how we pestered the big boys. During Turning Point 04, two actors dressed as Vince McMahon and Triple H arrive at the arena to stop TNA from broadcasting the footage. We get skits throughout the night, lucky us, with Vince raging and trying to fire TNA crew whilst his son-in-law smashes up tapes with a sledgehammer. Vince ends up getting beaten up backstage and taken out of the arena on a stretcher. It's all very clever and all very highbrow. At the request of Dusty Rhodes, then on-screen boss, TNA aired the video known internally and now externally as Cookie Game. In it, Shane Douglas, Abyss, and Tracy Brooks head out onto the back lot where WWE is filming armed with balloons and homemade cookies to welcome their new neighbors. Shane cut the damn music. Douglas took great joy in throwing a couple of pot shots at the company that made him dress up like a teacher back in the 90s. They were joined by the three live crew, BG James, Ron Killings, and Conan. And they had a, a lovely time schmoozing with WWE cast and crew. We think they were schmoozing with them anyway because to avoid any blowback from WWE's legal beagles, anybody who is anybody from the Stanford side is blurred out. We can, however, see an unmasked Rey Mysterio, face blurred regardless, throwing up the three live crew hand gesture before retreating inside the soundstage building. There's another person who's completely blurred out, and it's tricky to identify who that is. Well, one, because it's blurred out, and also because they're filming this West Side Story-inspired wrestling commercial, so they're all in big floppy wigs. We reckon based on the size and the toupee tautness, that's probably Luther Reigns. A catering area once swarming with the blurry shapes of WWE people is now just the home of a few tech hands and the TNA lads, with BG James unable to shut up about the Mahi Mahi on offer on the catering table. They invite Vince McMahon to pop out for a chat, which to the shock of nobody, he doesn't. The controversial clip ends with Shane Douglas continuing to goad McMahon into coming out for a chat about things from the past. Ha ha ha. BG banging on about Mahi Mahi and R-Truth eating food he took from the catering table. You naughty TNA boys and girls. Not only do we not see who from WWE interacted with the TNA neighborinos that day, but we don't see apparently security sternly ushering Shane, Tracy, Abyss and 3LK off the soundstage and back up up their own end as well. This was TNA playing silly buggers with the big boys, and it would not stop there. A few of these crossovers now are merely nods to the other parties, but worth giving a mention as it clearly puts WWE and TNA in its own special kind of multiverse, like Kid Cash turning up and going hog wild at ECW One Night Stand 2005. Cash had been for years a part of TNA and was getting very unhappy about being there. He was especially critical of them when he was back and from being part of WWE's one-night reboot of Extreme Championship Wrestling, which consequently led to his release from the company, and it gave him carte blanche to pull up to the ballroom and give us a bit of ballroom blitz at the Hammerstein. As he did, Joey Styles on commentary declared his shocking appearance as that of Kid Cash, Mr. TNA, total non-stop attitude. With so many ex-WWE guys finding fortune in TNA, there were bound to be a few verbal guns 
holstered for some shooting. Rhino set his sights on Vince McMahon in a scintillating 2006 interview where he lambasted Vinnie Mac for attempting to restart ECW and the legal wranglings that he's had from WWE to try and get the ECW TV title back from him. We have the debut of the Dudley Boys, sorry, Team 3D, telling Vince McMahon to trademark this in reference to Vince and Co. stopping them being Bubba and doing Devon outside the sports entertainment house. When Mr. Kennedy won his disgusting version of the TNA title, he launched into a spiel about how the place that he'd worked at before told him what to do and when to do it, even told him not to chew gum. Oh, shooty, shooty. The most creative WWE call out in TNA history comes from two of its former Attitude Era stars in Brian James Armstrong and Monty Sop. The New Age Outlaws played good old days in-laws on TNA Impact, referring to themselves first as the James Gang and then the Voodoo Kin Mafia. The joke is the initials of VKM, same as Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Could also mean violent kite manufacturers or Vols Kaleidoscope Miscreants. But the plan was definitely for the name to be a hated homage to Vinnie Mac. The name came quite simply from BG James and his son looking up cool words on the computer that started with V, K and M. Is it really? The whole gimmick was born when BG and Kip James, the James gang, after finding each other like star-crossed lovers, were sick of their creative in TNA and stormed out in speech marks. When they returned, they were now the Voodoo Kin Mafia and their goal was simple, to challenge their former besties, now sworn enemies, Paul Levesque and Michael Hickenbottom, who were having a lovely time in WWE at this point in the midst of a DX Indian summer in 2006. They wanted to have a fight with them. We had the VKM outside WWE HQ trying to get McMahon to sign a cease and desist to stop Triple H and Shawn Michaels' DX revival. This even involved them sleeping rough outside WWE offices and lampooning Paul Levesque and Michael Hickenbottom at every turn. This includes hiring their own fat oily guy, beating up their own version of the Spirit Squad, and eventually throwing down a million dollar challenge for a real fight. This wasn't a storyline either. Dixie Carter had, according to reports, earmarked a million dollars in case WWE really did cash in on this overtly daft offer. And it gave us a memorable, memeable moment when VKM bedecked in Mexican and tire and sombreros challenged Shawn Michaels to meet them in Texas for this aforementioned fight. Since Shawn was a part-timer these days, they said they would meet on his doorstep at the Alamo. Cue a video of these two silly billies live Parking around at the historic Battle of the Alamo site with not a single battle to be had because Short Michaels, of course, didn't turn up at the Alamo. There was clearly zero way to pay off this thing in a satisfactory manner because it was one-way traffic. WWE weren't going to acknowledge the shenanigans from TNA, let alone take them up on their offer. If they weren't going to respond to Eric Bischoff in WCW at the height of the Monday Night Wars, they were not going to bite on this low-hanging, far less tantalizing fruit. That's not to say that TNA wasn't getting some kind of acknowledgement on WWE programming around this time. It was at the start of 07 where a Vince McMahon creative classic was ripped from the paper into the peepers of the people as Donald Trump battled Rosie O'Donnell, a match that saw the crowd show their displeasure in WWE's pencil by chanting TNA, as Trump and Donald had something that resembled a wrestling match whilst Vince McMahon sat at ringside. Vince McMahon and WWE creative, whilst not acknowledging this tribal cheek, very much knew TNA were on the radar. Several occasions, where bad storytelling would be graded with the initials TNA by WWE crowds did not go amiss. The fans would get much closer to WWE by calling their live internet show Bite This and putting over TNA, much to the chagrin of host Todd Grisham. One fan called simply to tell Todd, I love how you dodge TNA questions like you dodge women. Todd's reply, I don't dodge women, they dodge me. <laughs> He'd also insult fans that called to put over TNA, something that happened more frequently when they realized how under Todd's skin it got. Todd Grisham has made peace with TNA fans around the world in an interview with my mate Muscle Man Malcolm saying they're still on the air. Congratulations to them. I respect anybody in the wrestling business that's still doing their thing. TNA were given quite the gift in 2008. No, not a Todd Grisham breakdown, but a signed WWE talent decided to pop to the impact zone and check out a live TNA event. The production truck took great pleasure in broadcasting 
broadcasting to the world that gracing TNA Impact was Derek Graham Couch, aka Robbie McAllister of the Highlanders. Robbie and Rory were on the back foot of a run in WWE at this point. They'd been eating losses to Hornswoggle and Finlay on TV quite a bit. When Robbie decided, whilst WWE were in the area, to go and watch some of the live wrestling. When he got back to his hotel, he had his arse lit on fire by Fit Finlay, The Undertaker, and John Laurinaitis, the head of talent relations at the time. He stayed with WWE for six months, did Robbie, where he looked at the lights more times than a puzzled electrician before being outcast forever. All because he took in an episode of Impact and gave what some perceived a win to TNA. It was in 08 that TNA decided to cross the line. At WrestleMania 24, they set up a booth outside the Citrus Bowl where Mania was emanating from. They handed out t-shirts and flyers for fans arriving for the granddaddy of them all. At WWE Access, the WrestleMania fan convention, several TNA talents like Team 3D, Frankie Kazarian, AJ Styles, rocked up plugging the alternative up the road at Universal Studios. Got under the skin a little bit at WWE that did. They also apparently planned, did TNA, to fly a plane over the Citrus Bowl with a banner promoting impact. Now the story goes that WWE officials found the company that TNA had hired and convinced them, presumably with a big bag of money, to not take off. The night after Mania as well, Raw came from the Amway and a TNA truck played footage from Impact outside the venue. WWE obviously had the truck moved and in an attempt to not shoot the messenger, refunded the truck driver for his car parking ticket. What a great bunch of lads. Several of TNA's gimmicks that pulled into creative around 08 were crossovers per se, but not dangling a carrot through a yet unmade forbidden door. You had Jay Lethal becoming Black Machismo, reenacting the Macho Man Ms. Elizabeth love story with SoCal Val. And we had Shark Boy waking up from a coma to become a beer swilling, finger gesturing Texas rattle shark. It was the peculiar birth of Stone Cold Shark Boy, wrestling's finest fin fighter, breaking out his hilarious Steve Austin impression every week on Impact. Surely, Steve Austin must have been apoplectic that this weird riptide ripoff was occurring. Actually, no. When asked about him, Steve Austin said he saw it as homage from TNA. He said, if some guy can go to another territory, put on a shark costume, talk about drinking clam juice and mimic Stone Cold and get paid for it, I'm down for it, man. He's got over. I've got no issues with Shark Boy. So that's the end of that. If one moment looked to turn TNA into a light version of WWE, it was the arrival of Hulk Hogan in 2010. Hogan, along with Eric Bischoff and a walking checkbook named Dixie Carter, promised to get TNA back on track, brother, as a company. The plan to bring in as many ex WWE names as possible and make the show look as much like WWE as possible. Hogan also introduced the TNA fans to the most powerful force in wrestling. Not his 24 inch pythons, not his bag of vitamins, not his check from Gorka, no, his actual WWE Hall of Fame ring. The jewelry presented to the great and good of the wrestling world when they are inducted into the annals of wrestling history. For some, it's a great piece of tact to throw on eBay when the mortgage is due. However, as Hogan revealed on TNA Impact, the WWE Hall of Fame ring is actually imbued with magic powers that make you unstoppable. Desperate to see Abyss reach his full potential, Hogan presented Abyss with his Hall of Fame ring, whilst very carefully making sure the WWE logo wasn't shown on camera. And with that, it made Abyss an indestructible vessel for Hulkamania for a bit because Abyss ended up being controlled by another evil vessel who forced Abyss to shove the ring down Hogan's throat. Of course, it was a weird time for TNA, the Hulk Hogan era, as it very much became the Hulk Hogan show. Certainly that's another video for another time though. The WWE Hall of Fame plays a major factor in another momentous moment where TNA and WWE crossed the line. It was in 2012, where WWE were inducting the Four Horsemen into the Hall of Fame the night before WrestleMania. But there was an issue. Ric Flair, the leader of the limousine riding, jet flying, kiss stealing, wheeling, dealing lads, was under contract to TNA. 
His time in the Impact Zone had been interesting. He'd led a faction that definitely wasn't the Four Horsemen. He decided the best thing for AJ Styles' career was to cosplay as Ric Flair, and he'd chosen to not leave the memories alone and make an in-ring return across the ring from Hulk Hogan, one for whom memories are becoming memories as each day passes. His most watched TNA moment was, without a doubt though, his sweaty confusion to Jay Lethal's spot-on Ric Flair impression and the woo-off that followed. The sun was setting on Flair's TNA time. But when the Hall of Fame was coming round, he was still on TNA's books. So WWE had to do something that they have tried very hard to avoid. Acknowledge TNA's existence as a wrestling company. When WWE asked if they could borrow their Nature Boy for an evening, TNA were very much up for striking a deal. They wanted something in return. They wanted former NWA champion Christian back for one night only. Christian, as Christian Cage, had a veritable career renaissance as part of TNA before returning to WWE as part of their Noah's Arcade Presents Wayne's World version of ECW. Commentary making his return to the loving embrace of WWE as enthusiastically as receiving a car tax bill. When WWE went to TNA cap in hand for the Nature Boy, Christian was the reigning Intercontinental Champion. And TNA wanted the cage to rage one more time in return for handing over Flair. Several phone calls, almost mistaken as ribs, and reams of paperwork later, the deal was on. At Slammiversary 2012, Hulk Hogan brought out one of his big surprises, and it was the reigning Intercontinental Champion, Christian Cage. Sadly, not carrying the IC title, I think that would have been amazing. Uh, he entered the ring and paid homage to the fans of the company and introduced a TNA highlight reel. No wrestling, but an instantly classic moment nonetheless. The Wrestling Observer noted that this could have been even more instantly classic because WWE were apparently willing to have done more than what we saw with this crossover. They offered to plug Christian's appearance at Slammiversary on Raw, but Dixie Carter refused, saying she wanted to make Christian's announcement exclusively to Twitter, which feels like a massively missed opportunity. Hearing WWE announcers plugging Slammiversary would have been surreal at the time and probably would have caused Todd Grisham's head to fall off. Because mentions of other wrestling companies were so taboo in WWE. People found ways to mention them without mentioning them. Like the time when Vince McMahon threatened to fire John Cena and Big Match John said if he did, he'd simply show up on someone else's show, brother, alluding to the red and yellow money hoovering machine that was making the Impact Zone his personal playground. We had Caval, the grumpy baritone formerly known as Loki, when he was on the game show version of NXT, forced to rap, dropping the bars, go ahead and call me rookie, find Find out what I'm packing, because I'm the only reason for some total non-stop action. The commentators attempted to talk over it before declaring what he did stupid, aware that Vince was going to chew somebody out for that, and all they could do was be ready. WWE attempted to keep TNA kind of underneath them in a way, by offering industry news on WWE.com for a while. So it was very interesting to hear and see results from TNA shows get reported at WWE.com. It was part of a thing they wanted to do where they wanted to become a hub for industry news. It didn't last very long. What a strange little moment that was. In the years to come, TNA would also get a mention or two on WWE television, including Kurt Angle as Raw GM, advising the recently fired Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn that TNA might be hiring. It got a laugh out of the crowd and several news articles out of aggregators, so everybody wins. Relationships between the two sides have been much cooler in the years that came from that. True, they, TNA, attempted to do their own version of WWE's ECW One Night Stand with TNA Hardcore Justice and the faction EV 2.0 being an ECW reunion ordered off of Tamu. And true, Dixie Carter made Eric Young the TNA champion in a weird attempt to scrape up some momentum from Daniel Bryan becoming WWE champion, what with both guys being bearded underdogs with decades of fan support behind them, I guess. But it felt like when AJ Styles, the perennial TNA guy, made his WWE debut to a thunderous ovation in the Royal Rumble, any sense of a battle of the brands was gone. After all, the WWE roster in 2016 looked more like TNA than TNA did. AJ Styles then found himself on the opposite side of the line that he had crossed so many times, now being told not to talk about TNA again. It was alluded to on an episode of Edge and Christian's WWE Network show in which Styles guested on, where instead of writing TNA on the screen, they showed a photo 
photo of Tiande, the test Albert and Trish Stratus faction. I see what you did there. That mindset was changing though, and no more was that on show than another episode of another network program on the WWE Network, Table for Three, where a trifecta of talent talk shop and break bread. The penultimate episode of season five. I know, right? There's been like 60 episodes. Imagine the bar tab. The penultimate episode of series five was called Impactful Reunion, and it was WWE contracted talent, AJ Styles, Jeff Jarrett, and Sting talking about their time in TNA, complete with photos from the Impact Zone. It was also in 2020 when AJ Styles not only briefly had Joseph Park, not Abyss, playing his statistics analyst on SmackDown, but he was distracted in a match by Xavier Woods of The New Day, playing his TNA theme, I Am, I Am on the trombone. Consequences Creed taking us all back with that one. By this point, the backstage area of WWE, as well as the roster, as I said, was being more and more populated by ex-TNA talents. And we're also getting a younger generation of stars who grew up with TNA. So whilst TNA under Dixie Carter and Hulk Hogan especially set out to win the war against WWE by counter-programming on a Monday night, arranging plane flyovers, eating their mahi-mahi, and all those throwdowns at the Alamo, all they had to do was just stay the course, create a product and an energy that people could connect with. WWE is still on the marquee, but the amount of TNA names now attached to WWE shows shows how much of an impact pun very much intended, this company has made. Plus, TNA can say, in 2020, they were the only wrestling company to feature The Rock. <laughs> Another surreal moment created in the Impact Zone during the pandemic, when Dwayne Johnson, via pre-recorded video, inducted Ken Shamrock into the Impact Wrestling Hall of Fame. It was a deal set up innocently enough, as it seems, on Twitter, with Ken asking Rocky to induct him. At the height of COVID, and with the world on lockdown, Rock, like all of us, didn't have a lot going on. It was either, like, send a video inducting Ken Shamrock rock into the hall of fame or i know mow the lawn again go for a socially distanced walk have a zoom dinner with a friend gosh what a weird time that was so rock very graciously accepted the honor and it gave us the surreal visual of the most electrifying man in sports entertainment on impact wrestling television Time heals all wounds. And it seems that despite some of the silly buggers TNA played at WWE's expense, there were olive branches growing. As we entered 2022, the news broke that entering the Women's Royal Rumble would be reigning TNA Knockout World Champion, Mickie James. James had been unceremoniously released by WWE the year before. Her belongings from her locker sent to her in a bin bag for added oof effect. A return to a familiar stomping ground in Impact Wrestling put any self-esteem issues to bed as Mickey assumed a locker room leader role in what is considered the best women's division in the West. The idea came about of a of an Impact run-in, according to reports, as a desire to change the perception of WWE. With AEW working with Impact and New Japan and CMLL, there was a desire for wrestlers to open what would become known as the Forbidden Door more often. Daniel Bryan, whilst in WWE, cites a big reason that he didn't stay there was because he wanted to try his arm working a few dream matches elsewhere, something that WWE was somewhat reticent to do. So WWE left their Forbidden Door ajar and Nikki James pushed through. The presentation was near perfect. She came out to hardcore country. She had the knockouts title over her shoulder, but in a weird Vince-ism, it was insisted upon that she be referred to as the Impact Women's Champion, not the Impact Knockouts Champion. Otherwise, otherwise, apart from that, it was great to see another wrestling universe acknowledged by WWE once again. A few months later, WWE helped orchestrate another Slammiversary surprise. Ten years on from Christian Cage's shock rock-up, as the phenomenal AJ Styles sent a video message home to Impact, reflecting on his favourite moments as part of TNA. The good vibes kept coming, and this year, Jordan Grace bulldozed her way into the Royal Rumble, now recognized as TNA Knockouts World Champion, leaving an indelible mark on that match. Grace tweeted a video of her elimination of, from the Rumble, uh, courtesy of Bianca Belair, with the caption, words couldn't do my feelings justice about any of this, overwhelmed by the love. That being said, this would never happen on my home turf. 
So could we see WWE working with TNA again? Well, from here, the rumors began swirling of a relationship forming between TNA and WWE. Rumors that started small, with TNA referring to their pay-per-views all of a sudden as premium live events, a term WWE coined a few years back for their own. Grace's Rumble moment was replayed on TNA Impact a few days later and celebrated as a milestone moment for the Knockouts division. She'd make history in that division once again, a few months later, when she was revealed as Roxanne Perez's next challenger for the NXT Women's Championship, which brings us to where we are right now. Her shock appearance on NXT even shocked Perez. As Jordan Grace revealed in an interview on Fightful, she confirmed that Roxanne Perez didn't want to know who she was facing until she actually came out there. NXT officials wanted to, wanted to let her in on it, and she was like, now nah, I want to find out with everybody else. I want to know what's happening with everybody else. It was a closely guarded situation secret from the wrestling world. Jordan Grace has admitted she's facing a lot of pressure carrying the possibility of a WWE TNA relationship on her shoulders. She said that her biggest fear is falling short of expectations and is working out in her head how she should begin to approach the match that she's going to have and how she should perform. She recognizes that getting this wrong could be seen as quote cataclysmic but despite that the door's already open. Her appearance on NXT led to sources in the industry report that WWE and TNA's tussle on a Tuesday night isn't a one and done. There are plans in place to harness this relationship with WWE stars and TNA stars cross-pollinating pile drivers when the time and the place is right. It led to a litany of dream matches being dreamt up by not just the fans, but the WWE and TNA stars as well. Moose wants to get in a dust-up with Drew McIntyre. Mustafa Ali is willing to defend the X Division title against former 205 Live roommate Cedric Alexander. Speedball Mike Mike Bailey wants to try himself against AJ Styles, whilst the New Day want to record a diss track with Joe Hendry. Both sides want a piece of the crossover cake, and everybody's hungry for it. To stand on the precipice of WWE and TNA utilizing this prohibited portal, as it's been coined, is incredible when you consider just how this rocky relationship started. Time is a great healer, and when it comes to WWE and TNA joining forces, We've barely felt the impact yet. Stay safe. Love you, bye. And meet me at the Alamo!